Hey, hope all is well. This is another video in the Road to Grandmaster series. And this one I'm going over my round seven game from the Charlotte Spring GM IM Invitational. Now, if you saw the round six video, you know that I won a really, really complicated back and forth game against International Master Christopher Yu. And I was really fortunate to win it in the end. And it put me on plus two, and what that meant was I was on pace, if I continued with some good results, to get a GM norm. So to get a GM norm in one of these closed uh, tournaments, you need to score six and a half out of nine, and that amounts to plus four. What, what plus four means in chess uh, terms is you have a net four more wins than you have losses. Um, so essentially, if you think about golf, golf talks about chess scores in terms or golf talks about scores in terms of minus. So they say like if you have minus one, it's it's a, a birdie. If you have an even, it's par. And even in chess is like a draw. But uh, instead of be, having a minus score being good in golf, in chess we want a, as high a plus score as possible. So me being on plus two meant that if I had two more wins in the next three rounds without losing, I secured the norm. So I was really trying to play for a win in this game. Now, my opponent was no slouch. Uh, I was playing international master Advait Patel, who I believe also, I know he had at least one GM norm at the, GM norm at the time. Maybe he had two. And it's just a very formidable player and a little bit higher raid than me as well. So I was not going into this one lightly. And if you actually saw the game I played with him in the last round of the Southwest class in February of 2019, you know that he actually beat me the last time we played. So I was definitely very alert, but also excited for the opportunity. This is this is pretty much why you play chess for opportunities like this where you get to play for something. Um, and, you know, as far as chess is concerned, you're rarely playing for any serious money. So you're really playing for for these moments. So anyways, enough talk. Let me get into it. So I was white. I'm with d4. Advait went knight f6. I went c4, g6, and I went knight c3. And I couldn't, I wasn't completely sure whether he'd go King's Indian or Grunfeld, but I had a feeling he would go King's Indian because I'd seen him do it in the past and he did. So it was, I guess, correctly. And after e4, d6, f3, I decided to surprise him here. Now, I wasn't I had never actually played the Samus variation of the King's Indian in my life, at least not in a serious game, and I thought this would be a good way to surprise him. We'd actually had a game in 2018, believe it or not, in June of 2018, where I went knight f3, and it went castles, bishop e2, c5, and castles, and he transposed to like a Maroxy bind structure like so, and I actually managed to win this game with white. And so I didn't think he would, you know, try and go for this type of position again because I did a pretty good job of squeezing him in this Maroxy bond type structure. So I figured he would try to go for some normal King's Indian. But again, I wasn't sure what variation he would go for, whether he'd go for e5, um, whether he put the knight on d7 or on c6, or sometimes you can even put on a6. He, you know, he can choose to take on d4 or not take on d4. So I was really unsure of what he was going to do, and because of that, I thought it was a little bit smarter to kind of be the first one to surprise, and I knew for sure I'd be the first one to surprise by playing f3. He thought for a little while here, and then wound up playing castles, which is the normal move. And then I went knight ge2, and now here's like the first decision that black needs to make, because when you're playing this structure, um, Black has two ways to play with the pawns. One is to play for c5, and the other is to play for e5, and they both have different implications. Now, if you play for e5, um, typically white will go d5 and close the middle, and the point is is that these typical, you know, playing for ch checkmate on the, on the king side type structures with knight e8 and f5 are not as potent because white has already set up this lovely pawn chain, in particular with f3 and g2, so white closing the center and playing for g4 is not going to necessarily work in the same way. Uh, the flip side of that is that they can play c5. And if they play c5, it if white pushes, it kind of transposes to Benoni-type systems after e6. And these type of systems after like bishop e3, takes on d5, c takes d5, 
are extremely unbalanced and extremely sharp. The point is that black has a, a you know a little queen side pawn majority, uh, but black or but white has a king side pawn majority. So you can see the five versus four on the king side really is uh, gives white great attacking chances um, and just a long term uh, stranglehold on the center. So those are the kind of the dynamics at play. Um, so, in fact, at, uh, Patel actually did wind up going c5, and I had a decision here whether to push and go for those Benoni-type structures or to keep the tension. I thought it would be best to keep the tension because I'd had uh, success against them playing a Maroxy bind type of structure before with this e4 and c4 pawn both, you know, binding the black center a little bit. And so I thought, you know, maybe I should keep the tension and play a more, bit of a more controlled game and invite him to do that. So I went for bishop e3. Uh, and this move has actually been is played quite a bit, but it's not as popular as d5. So I expected black to resolve the tension in the center. I actually thought c takes d4, knight takes d4, and I thought we would transpose back to a Maroxy bind type of structure. But it turned out that he had different plans in mind, and he went very quickly for knight c6. And knight c6 is a theoretical move and shouldn't have come as a huge surprise, but I was a little bit surprised because I thought he would release the tension and I would have this Maroxy bond, and now I don't necessarily have that. And the thing is, in this position, it's almost like he's inviting d5 with tempo attacking this knight. But the issue is that when it comes to e5, it's in a very, very secure square because it hits my c4 pawn with tempo, and I can never really kick it away effectively with f4 because the knight always has the g4 square afterward. So just to illustrate that, let's say d5, knight e5, and I need to defend the c4 pawn, so let's say I go knight g3 to defend it, and then they go e6, and you can see I would love to play f4 to kick this knight away, but whenever I play f4, um, not bishop f4, f4, sorry, I don't have a mouse here, so uh, I, my mouse stopped working uh, earlier today, so I ordered a new one, and I'm waiting on it, so I'm moving all of these moves with my, my trackpad, which is not as fun. But uh, after f4, you can see that this knight has the g4 square, and it's very, very annoying, this knight coming to g4, because, you know, my bishop is really not secure on e3, and it, you know, would maybe have to go back to g1 to be kind of secure, but, you know, black is already ready to play like e takes d5 and rook e8 and open the center, where I'm woefully behind in development because I set up this pawn structure. So because of those dynamics, I was just not keen on having the knight come to f5 because I can't kick it away very easily. So because of that, I decided to keep the tension again by playing queen d2. Now, you might have asked, and I guess I didn't address it, why not d takes c5? Well, this is actually a theoretical line. It's a it's a pawn sacrifice. The point is after d takes c5, queen takes d8, rook takes, oop, not knight takes, that's chess base making a bad move, rook takes d8, and bishop takes c5. Actually, even though black is a pawn down here, this diagonal is wide open for uh, black's fianchet on bishop, and the b4 and d4 squares are a little bit sensitive. So after b6, um, apparently black is supposed to have full compensation. And I didn't really want to test this theoretical knowledge here, especially because I wasn't familiar with the details myself. So I decided to not go for this line. So anyway, I went queen d2, trying to keep that tension. Again, still inviting this c takes d4, knight takes d4 operation. And here I really got shocked with knight d7. Because I thought here that he was going to have to resolve the tension and that we were playing this like extended game of chicken to see who would resolve the tension. And I thought he would blink first. And knight d7 shows that he's not willing to blink. And the nice thing about knight d7 is now you reinforce the pawn on c5 with your knight. So it's not even a real, it's not even a sacrifice anymore if I want to take on c5. And now the bishop on g7 is also involved in the act on the d4 pawn. So very much you know, just a, a real pressure cooker right now. So I had a few options here, um, but uh, I really still thought that he would have to relieve the tension. And I was like, well, you know what? Now this knight has left the f6 square, you know, now some, you know, the h5 kind of push is a little bit sensitive because a lot of times you might think about playing h4, h5 in these structures when you have a queen on d2 and a bishop on e3, almost in like an English attack style from a Sicilian. 
So I decide to castle Queen's side, thinking that now that he's not resolving the tension in the center, I'm ultimately going to blast with h4, h5 later. Reasonable idea, but wrong execution. Um, instead, it would have been much more sensible to go h4, because now I'm actually threatening h5 right away, and my king is still hasn't really you know, clarified itself in the center, but it can still decide whether they go king side or queen side or even just stay in the middle. So h4 actually would have been a more more precise move because it really forces white black's hand a little bit more. And in fact, h5 would pretty much need to be played to stop me from playing h5. And now I can castle and at least argue that the inclusion of h4 and h5 has weakened black's king side and has given me a potential hook to open up the, um, the his king side with g4 later. Now, instead of that happening, I played castles, and the reason this was not maybe the wisest move is because now black played a6, and I realized here, wow, black can threaten actually to play b5 and at the cost of a pawn rip open the entire queen side that my king is supposed to be secure on. So after a6, I really realized, oh my god, this is super dangerous, and really just, I mean, like, b5 is a serious threat. Like, how do I stop b5? Like, if I play h4 now, a move like b5 could be extremely scary, because all of a sudden, if I take on b5, you can see this rook comes into the game way too quickly, and if I ignore it, maybe b4 is an idea. Maybe b4 challenges my knight on c3 uncomfortably. Maybe the queen comes to a5. Maybe the rook comes to b8 and pressures down the b file. The point is, is that my king is kind of walked into the onslaught, which is, you know, the fire on this side of the board. And it's kind of like out of the frying pan into the fire. And you can see now that my king on still being on e1 could have been a little bit more sensible. So that's why it's a little bit a little bit wild when I saw a6. So in any case, I figured that I can't really allow b5 at all costs because just opening this position now, I'm just not ready for it on the queen side. So I went for d takes c5, which is not something I wanted to do, resolve the tension in the center, but I thought I was kind of obligated to do so. And my idea was that after knight takes c5, which was played, uh, I went knight d4. And the point is, is that now, with the knight on d4 hitting the c6 knight, b5 is impossible for now because the knight would be hanging. So I thought, you know what? If he wants to play b5, he's going to have to trade a few pieces. And, you know, trading a few pieces might help my cause dealing with b5. The secondary point was that now that I have my knight, um, now that I have my knight on c3, my pawn on c4 uh, on this square, I also have my bishop on f1 as well. So the point is that if b5 did come, I could play c takes b5, and after a takes b5, capture with the bishop. And in that way, my knight on c3 would still be guarding the pawn on a2. So that was the other idea, is at least my bishop on f1 that's still undeveloped is eyeing that critical b5 break. But I must say, I thought the opening was kind of a failure, because I thought I was going to get some type of extended positional battle, and we're already in a, a full-throated you know, tactical affair where my king doesn't feel totally secure on the queen side. So anyways, black went bishop d7, guarding that knight on c6. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think still thinking about b5. And I went knight takes c6. I thought I had to kind of try and trade some pieces so that this attack or potential breakthrough on the queen side would not be as robust. And black went bishop takes c6. And now I went bishop d4. And this was kind of the idea with taking on c6 is, again, you can see I want to trade a yet another pair of minor pieces just to kind of, you know, negate the impact of b5. So you can see I already was sort of in like a defensive mode given the situation that happened out of the opening. Um, so black wound up taking on, uh, on d4. And I, I should point out that uh, you could have also said maybe why not bishop h6 trying to get the bishop this way. Well, actually, the thing that I was worried about, and this is the reason I didn't play uh, bishop uh, h6, was I actually thought exchange sacrifices were playable with bishop f6. Point being that after like bishop takes f8 and queen takes f8, 
or even king takes f8, honestly. Either way, I actually thought this bishop on f8 would be extremely valuable on this diagonal, and black could still break through with b5. So I actually thought that I'm not actually forcing off the, the fianchio to bishop. And actually, this exchange sacrifice is very common from Sicilian dragons, um, where you identify that this dark square bishop is so valuable that it's sometimes even worth a rook. And I thought here he might go for it. So I thought bishop d4 was the safe and smart way to trade the bishops. Because now if he insists on keeping the bishops, he has to make a move like f6 or e5, which both shut down the diagonal uh, for that bishop on g7. So that was the kind of kind of cunning way of trading it. Black took the bishop on d4. I went queen takes, and so the first operation is kind of done, which is trade a few minor pieces because I thought uh, there was an impending attack on the queen side, and now I managed to stave it off just a little bit. But in any case, black went for it and played b5 anyway because he essentially was saying, you know, if my rook gets active on the a file, you're not going to survive this one. Um, this knight is too good here. The rook would be great here. The queen is one move away from swinging the other rook out, and it just would not, white would not survive, in particular with this bishop on f1 and this rook on h1 not even participating yet in the game. So you can see actually black has a little bit of a lead in development and just a lead in initiative. I haven't even managed to start my own play on the king side yet. So it's kind of imperative that I don't take the pawn on b5. Now, the other thing to point out is you might say, well, b4 is a threat and your knight goes backward. Well, you know, maybe you can deal with that with like a3. Well, the issue is with this king on c1 and the queen on d4, there's this nasty knight b3 check that always comes. So it's just something that's a real problem. And because of that, I can't even, you know, move this knight. Uh, I can't move this knight away. I can't uh, play a3. I kind of just have to hang tight for a while. So instead of doing anything with the b5 pawn, I went h4 saying, you know what, I just got to get on with it. And my thought process was if I get in h5, manage to open the h file, I have my own ideas of checkmate on h8. So now it's like a real race to see who can get there first. Black went queen a5, ignoring my h5 idea, and I think that makes sense. I think the point is, is that we're both kind of bat racing to get our own initiative going. And if you play like a move like h5 to stop, stop my h-pawn, it's only temporary because I only go g4 and I'm still going to rip open the king side somehow because if you go h takes g4, now I have h5 and now it looks like white is the one getting somewhere. So very sharp position and sometimes it's actually best to just not push any of the pawns in front of your king because it will just accelerate the pawn storm. So sometimes you just let it happen and you hope that you're faster on the other side. And that's kind of what we're both doing. So after h4, queen a5, you can see that b4 is you know, kind of a legitimate threat because once my knight moves, the a2 pawn is hanging. So that's something I have to be concerned about. Um, again, there's also the potential of now rook coming to b8 and the b2, b2 being a problem. So still very, very sharp, very complicated position. But I went for king b1, and I thought I could afford to do a little bit of prophylaxis here because I thought I really want to make sure that my knight can move to a square that's reasonable while the a2 pawn is protected. So now just sliding my king over enables that. Now you might say, hey, aren't you walking right into the line of fire of a rook that may come to b8? And I would say, yeah, I am, but it's kind of the lesser evil at this point. I mean, it's going to take, you know, maybe two to three moves for a rook to come to b8 and then for some pressure to come on the b2 pawn. And I cannot afford to lose the a2 pawn that quickly because then, you know, if I do, the black queen would go from a2 then to a1 and then check me and just totally infiltrate. So I figured I had to protect that pawn. So now black went rook fb8, which I kind of expected, um, you know, keeping tension on this this pawn on c4 and just hinting at ripping open the b file but giving white the opportunity to, to you know do it for him note that you know if he did play b takes c4 in this position that would actually kind of help me because now after bishop takes c4 my bishop covers the a2 pawn uh, my rooks are now connected which they weren't before and now 
In addition, my bishop is also an attacking piece eyeing f7, so that if I'm able to get an h5, after h takes g6, he'd have to recapture with the h pawn, and that would lead to mate on h8, because you see this pawn on f7 would be pinned. So I know that's a lot of arrows and, you know, diagramming, but the point is, is that uh, this bishop would be really active here, and black doesn't want to help me develop like that. And then when the bishop's on c4, I can also consider playing b3 sometimes to just protect that pawn on b3. So not advisable. So that's why I didn't do that. So after rook b8, I decide, all right, I got to keep going with my own stuff. And now I was thinking that I should go h5, but I wound up not doing it because I thought it was a little bit risky. The thing that I was worried about here was... Um, white going like b takes c4 and queen a3 or something like that with the rook here threatening some type of checkmate. And I thought that I, if I played h5, you know, I would be threatening something of my own, but I thought he might be fast here. And so I looked at h5 um, in my calculations, and the thing that concerned me was uh, knight e6. Note that if b4 is played, I was actually going to play h takes g6. And the point is, is that you can't take on c3 because I have g, uh, g takes h7 check. And after king f8, queen h8 queen, and that's mate. So because of that, I actually, black has to deal with the h takes g6 idea. Um, and after a, f takes g6, this would be a nice, you know, thing for, to happen to me because now the files opened up and I have some interesting play. And there might even be the possibility in some positions of a move like rook takes h7 happening. Um, the point is, is that I'm threatening queen g7 mate. And if the king captures, my rook might be able to swing over to h1 and get uh, another one in there. So there are some ideas with this rook sacrifice, but I was just not certain of that. And after h5, I figured the most precise move would be knight e6, kicking my queen away from uh, d4. And I saw this much. Um, after 96, I was looking at queen e3, and the thing that concerned me was this g5 move, and I thought that once g5 is played, actually, it's a little bit unusual, but I thought black could blockade on the dark squares by playing f6 or h6 next, and can continue with the play down the, down the, the queen side on my king. But actually, it turns out in this position after g5, I'm still better, and I can play the move e5. And this is a move that I completely missed and was totally way over my head in my calculations. Um, the point is, is that in many positions, the e4 square and the, and the diagonal is now vacant for my bishop to play on. And it actually turns out that white is just a, a lot better here after something like d takes e5 and knight d5, it's actually me that's creating threats on black's king before white, black has managed to create threats on my king. And it turns out that white would be better in this very complicated position. I mean, queen a4 is hard to see, threatening mate here, and then rook d2, another really strange prophylactic move defending b2. Anyway, this is a computer line, but the point is, is that even after b takes c4, knight takes e7, king f8, Knight f5, apparently white is significantly better here, but very hard to go for this with a rook here, a potential c3, and a queen also here. Just very, very complicated. So I didn't go for it, but I saw the first few moves of the line, and I thought, uh-uh, this does not working for me. And also seemed like g5 cut off a lot of my play, so I just decided not to go for it. So instead of this uh, going for h5, I went for knight d5, which I thought was a, a little bit safer and a lot more simplifying. The point is that I threatened knight takes e7 check, and you really can't ignore that threat because I also would be um, hitting the c6 bishop and then in turn forking the rook and the queen. So you really can't ignore that threat. And the other thing I liked about knight d5 is my queen now is defending the b2 pawn because the knight left that diagonal. So I thought I'm attacking and defending, and at least I'm not going to get checkmated in the next four or five moves. So uh, I thought that was the right way to go. And now black went rook b7 to defend that pawn. And it's a multi-purpose move because now you're actually defending the pawn and you're thinking about doubling. And now I went for h5, and I thought here this is... A little bit of a safer alternative because now I'm, you know, crashing in very quickly. I have my queen protecting b2, and again, I'm not going to get mated in the next few moves. 
Black went knight e6, challenging my my queen on d4. And the difference here um, with the position uh, that we have now and the one before in analysis is I have this move queen d2, which I played. And the point with queen d2 is that, you know, the knight has hit my queen, but now I'm willing to trade queens. And if the queens come off the board, there's certainly not going to be some type of checkmating attack. And that means that we're just going to get to an end game that is a little bit more my speed, you know, a little bit more my tempo. And I was kind of eager to get to that given the the status quo of the first, you know, 15 to 20 moves of this game. So I was really keen on, you know, kind of changing the dynamic. And uh, yeah, black black wasn't. Um, queen takes d2 is played. Um, I think it's kind of forced because you, you can't really avoid this trade. And if you back the queen up somehow, I'm going to play h takes g6. And then my queen is going to come into h6. So you can't really ignore it. And so after queen takes d2, rook takes d2, I kind of accomplished that goal of getting an end game where I'm not going to get mated. And I felt that the worst was over. I kind of breathed a sigh of relief. B4 was played here, closing the middle. And I think that's it was a kind of a controversial decision because on the one hand, it makes sense to, to shut down, um, to, you know, to control some dark squares and shut down you know, maybe my the activity of my bishop on this diagonal, potential occupation of the c-file. But on the flip side, you've kind of taken away all of your counterplay on my king, and it gives me a free hand to start to develop an initiative on the king side. So I thought, you know what? That's what I got to do. So I went h takes g6 first, uh, just because I did not want to allow black to play g5 and close the middle. I thought this is the perfect time to open up the file for my rook. And f takes g6 was played. And now I went g3. And the idea with g3 was to think about swinging my rook over to h2 like so. And also think about getting my bishop uh, maybe to g2 or h3 in the future. And the last thing, it was there were three parts to this move, was to control some important dark squares on the king side, in particular, G th uh, in particular f4 with the g3 pawn. Because the point is, is that... At any moment, I was thinking that black would play bishop takes d5 and kind of, you know, take this knight and try to get a grip on the dark squares. And it was important for me to have some coverage on some of these potential important dark squares that would, you know, be present after this exchange. Because once I lose that, you know, that knight, I really might risk, you know, being strategically risky or dubious, not having any dark square coverage. So that's why I went g3. Black went rook f8 to challenge my f3 pawn that was just weakened by my pawn push. And now I went bishop g2, which does kind of shut off my rook from this rook h2 plan, but it does now give me the idea of potentially playing with my h rook on one of these files, like on the c, d, or e file. So you give a little, you get a little. Um... Black went g5 now, trying to stop me from playing f4, because again, I was trying to now see some more dark squares on the queen side. And I actually was pretty happy with this move, because with g5, I thought that there was something that was a little bit fishy about Black's position. It seemed like g5 weakened some squares, particularly f5 and h5 stood out to me as a result of that pawn push. And it seemed like temporarily this rook on b7 wasn't really playing and this bishop on c6 was, you know, was playing, but it was kind of blocked out. And it seemed that I had a little bit more coordination at this moment. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to pause the video and try to find a move here that kind of takes advantage of Black's lack of coordination and maybe tries to press a little bit for me. So five seconds here. All right, hopefully you got a chance to pause the video and try to figure out you know, what was going on, maybe what white could do. The move I went in for was interesting, but not the best. And it's kind of funny because the move that is the best move and the one I'm going to show first is rook h6. And I saw this move, honestly. I, I looked at this move. I saw that I was hitting the knight. And I noticed that when the g-pawn was pushed, that he gave me this highway to the knight. And it's worth attacking that knight because the knight's protecting a very important g5 pawn. So you could say, okay, rook h6, the knight moves to c5, right? That's kind of forced. Um, note that the rook can't block because this knight 
is controlling that square, and the king can't protect because the h-diamond pawn is hanging. Fine. So knight c5 is a move. Now, after knight c5, here's where it gets tricky. So I thought rook h5 was going to be the move, and you know I looked at rook h5, and I was like, yeah, that's a good move. This makes sense. But what if the knight goes back to defend? Um, I was like, well, I don't want to, I don't want a repetition here with rook h6. I mean, that's no fun. But it turns out at this position after knight e6, there's a better move than rook h6. And this is what I missed. The move is, of course, and you probably can even see it now, bishop h3. And the point is I hit this knight with tempo. And it's also, you know, a check if I capture it. And so you have to deal with that threat. And after knight g7, which is pretty much the only move to attack my rook and avoid losing the g5 pawn with check. Now I can take that pawn, and after bishop takes d5, rook takes d5, and rook takes f3, it turns out in this position that I'm better because I can throw an e5 now, and now with this knight being pretty passive on g7, and my bishop kind of dominate. oh, that's a bad diagonal, my bishop dominating it right now, it's actually white that's better because I have good coordination here and really active pieces. Note that um, rook takes g3 doesn't really change very much. Um, in fact, I believe I might even be able to play e takes d6 here. That might actually be a move. Point being after rook h3, d7. Um, but yeah, it's just it's a very, very complicated position, but I think white winds up on the better side of it. And... Uh, yeah, I, I just missed this detail of hitting the pawn and then hitting the uh, hitting the knight after it returns to protect the pawn. So just a little bit of a finesse that I missed. Now instead, I played a move that I thought you know was pretty incisive, and it turned out it was probably the second best move, which was e5. And e5 was a, a temporary pawn sacrifice that was connected with some tactics. So the point was I wanted to ruin Black's pawn structure um, so that he had like ugly double pawns after d, d takes e5 and kind of, you know, sh you know, ruin the dark squared blockade that Black was potentially going to set up. Let's say I play a really, really lazy move instead of e5. Let's say I play a move like b3 and weaken more dark squares. Well, the thing that I was always worried about was a scenario like bishop takes d5, c takes d5, or let's say, I'm just saying c takes d5 for the sake of argument, and knight c5. And the thing that concerned me is, you know, this dark squares do a great job of, you know, restricting the files for my rooks and also restricting the activity of my bishop on g2. So I really want to avoid any dark square binds, and I thought e5 ensures that there is no such bind. So I was pretty happy to find that move. Now, d takes e5 was played. I think you need to do it because if you don't, I take and uh, I, I start to hammer away on the e file. And now I went rook e1, and this was the idea is that I thought I'm getting the pawn back anyway, and now black has some pretty weak pawns, so I should be in good shape. So now black played knight g7, actually just moving the knight away, and I got very excited here. I'm just taking this pawn, right? Well, the thing that I actually wound up not taking the pawn, even though it's the best move, and this is, again, a lack of calculation. The thing that concerned me about taking the pawn was if I go rook takes e5, there's e6. And my knight is hit, and I only have one square to go to, which is knight e3. And I thought, now I'm losing the f3 pawn. I'm going to be, I'm just trading pawns. How is this good for me? But it turns out that after bishop takes f3, I can play rook takes g5. And the point is I don't have to take this bishop and activate the rook because my rook is actually in a good spot guarding that bishop and my knight is also guarding the bishop as well. In my calculation in my head, I thought after bishop takes e3, f3, I'd play bishop takes. And after rook takes, I thought, okay, I can recover this pawn with rook takes g5, but look at my knight that's hanging, so it's not actually a good deal. And if I can't take the pawn on g5 and my pawn on g3 is hanging, who's the, be who's the person that's better in this position? Well, I thought it was black. So I did rejected this line because of this detail, but it turns out, again, I did not have to take this bishop here. So another thing that I missed, unfortunately, but 
And so instead of playing rook takes e5, I decided to go for something else a little bit more incisive. And this was connected to my calculation with the e5 move in the first place. And it was the move f4. And the point was, is I was trying to open up even more lines and take advantage of my bishop on this diagonal with this weak rook on b7 and this loose bishop on c6. So now I thought I might have some tactical discovery type of stuff going on connected with these unprotected pieces. So that was my idea, and I thought I'd have some real initiative here because you could see all of my pieces are working now, and I'm only down a pawn. My knight is centralized, my rooks are playing, my bishop is, you know, playing. So I thought, this is the way to go. So, and Advait, I must say, my opponent, Advait Patel, you know, he, he also was uh, thinking that I was, you know, very active here, and I could see was visibly concerned. Uh, now, I'm not a body language doctor, but it did look that way. So anyways, he played g takes f4. I think you have to kind of take my pawn there. And I went g takes f4. And now he went e6. And I think this is an extremely important move. Uh, if you play e takes f4, I believe this move loses on the spot to knight takes e7. The point is, is that I win a piece or an exchange. If you move the king away... I just take on c6 um, with one of my pieces, and so you pretty much have to play rook takes e7, but now I go rook takes and I'm an exchange up, and I think this should be, you know, close to winning position. I do recognize this f pawn is dangerous, so maybe f3, bishop f1, and there's a lot, maybe there's a lot of game left. Maybe it's not so clear, actually, because this knight might hop around and get some crazy activity, but I thought that white would really be better here, and I still have a feeling that's the case, so I think it was a good decision by black to go e6 and challenge my knight, because now I have to make a decision, and unfortunately, it's not the most fun decision, uh, because my knight really does not have a great retreating square. If I go to c3, you can see it's hanging, and if I go to e3, well, it's just kind of in the way of my rook, so... I thought I had to go forward, and I went knight f6 check, which was a discovery, taking advantage of this bishop on g2. Rook takes f6 was played. I went bishop takes c6, hitting the rook. And after rook c7, I went f takes e5, uh, intermediate move, because I'm hitting the rook on f6. And here, finally, the material is equal. So the skirmish has kind of died a little bit. Um, and I thought, you know what, the material is equal here. I have a bishop versus a knight. Maybe I should be able to press here, given those dynamics. But it turns out it's not so simple, and, you know, uh, Patel plays some very, very accurate moves here to hold the draw. Um, ooh, I think I just foreshadowed the result, but to, just to hold the balance, basically. Rook f8 was played, first defending the back rank, that's a very good move, and now my bishop on c6 is attacked, so I have to do something about that. I went bishop a4. Um, my idea was that if you take the c4 pawn, I thought maybe bishop b3 was an option. So rook takes c4 was played, and I was thinking about bishop b3, but then it dawned on me, this e6 pawn is protected by the knight on g7. I don't know if I want to do that, maybe I should be more active. Um, I went bishop b3 anyway. And then rook c5 was played. Um, the point is that if you go, like, let's say rook c6, my idea, I think, was actually to go rook d6 and to challenge this rook. And if you take it, if you take it, then I take with the e pawn and I'm still hitting e6. So that was somewhat of the idea there. So rook c5 was played, just putting pressure on my e5 pawn. And now I went for rook d7 and I thought, you know what, I need to get maximum activity here for my pawn deficit. So my rook is on the 7th, my bishop is eyeing the 6th pawn, I was thinking rook g1 is next and I might have something to play for. But uh, Patel went rook f7, challenging my rook immediately, and I think that's a good choice, just limiting my activity. And I don't really want to trade this rook because if I trade, you can see the king is also protecting the pawn now. Black is a pawn up, and this knight could get active, and my rook is tied to the e-pawn. I thought that might be a way to lose the game, and I did not want to do that. So after rook f7, I went rook d8 check. And after rook f8, rook d7, rook f7, we repeated and actually wound up agreeing to a draw here. 
very, very much up and down game. Um, it's very similar to the game I played against uh, Rohan in a previous round, I think in round five, where I was white and I felt like I was on the defensive kind of early on because, you know, my queen side was kind of under fire and my king kind of castled into it, which was not the intent. But that's kind of what can happen sometimes when you're not familiar with the opening with white and you're trying to play actively, but you just don't know all the details. And, uh, you know, then you kind of have to buckle down and shift your mindset a little bit to just surviving. And I think I did a good job of just surviving and managed to actually get some chances in the queenless middle game. But um, I did not fully take advantage of them. And, of course, you know, the players at this level are very good at defending. And so you could see that even when he got into some trouble, he wound up defending and was up to the task. So all in all, it's a, a draw is a fair result. I should say, too, that uh, Advait also had plus two going into this round, so we were both kind of trying to win, trying to get something going, so there was almost a little bit of poetic justice or maybe ironic cruelty, cruelty in us both drawing the game when we both so badly wanted to win, but it is what it is. All right, um, thanks for watching. Please like and or subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support the Road to Grandmaster journey, please do so by checking out the PayPal link in the description below. Thanks, take care.